Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the closing program of the 15th National Black Writers Conference. I am April Silver. Uh, I'm so honored to welcome all of you to what is our final day and our final program of this conference. I am the Communications and Marketing Director uh, Consultant to the Center for Black Literature, the, uh, the entity that of, of course is presenting this conference. I am also the head of Aquila Work Songs, which is a communications agency. And my team and I are the presenting partner this year to the 15th National Black Writers Conference. And I am absolutely excited and honored and feel privileged to be here with you, to welcome you to this part. Um, I wanted just before we get into the meat of the program, if you would just indulge me for just a little bit, um, we have some basic general thank yous. Um, I promise you, we do not have enough time to, to thank everyone that we want to. Uh, we don't have enough time to just express our gratitude so in the absence of time, I hope that you'll be able to feel the love and the excitement that we have and just the sheer, sheer gratitude for everyone who has been involved, um, all of our panelists. We've had a, a super robust, dynamic, enriching program starting back in September with our pre-conference uh, activities. So here we are rounding off and I just wanna put a couple of things in context as we move on and then uh, we'll turn it over to our esteemed guests. And most importantly, you'll have an opportunity to meet our very beloved honorees. I want to remind people for all of those who were, didn't have the opportunity to be with us on Wednesday, we announced that this conference would be uh, dedicated to the memory, to the life, to the legacy, to the never ending spirit of our beloved brother, Chadwick Boseman. As we all know, he began his transition into the ancestral world uh, realm earlier this year. And because this particular conference is focused on black playwrights and black screenwriters, Dr. Green and I, unbeknownst to each other, had the same thought at the same time. Uh, I happen to have said it first and that's when I found out we were thinking the same thing. Why not, in the most appropriate loving way, dedicate this gathering, this public gathering, to the memory, to the spirit of uh, our brother Chadwick Bozeman, given the focus that we have for this particular year. And so I want to highlight that uh, what we are honoring when we honor uh, Chadwick Bozeman and his memory, we're honoring the life choices that he made. We know that his entire career, uh, he chose us, he focused on us, and he is mostly known as an actor for many people. But upon deep investigation, we, we know that he was a playwright as well. He was a theater director. He was my beloved fellow HBCU graduate. We both graduated from Howard University at different times. Um, but he was also one who always chose us. So we would encourage everyone who's listening in real time, everyone who might experience this particular segment of our program after the fact, we would encourage people to think about the choices, think about choosing us as a collective. We would ask people to think about perseverance and humility and discipline. Those are the things that come to mind for so many of us when we think about the gifts that Chadwick Boseman left behind. So in those moments when you don't want to push forward or don't know how, uh, or you're considering your craft and the challenges that come with it, or you're considering whether or not it's worth it to stay on this black thing. And I'm sure I would imagine at any given point, many of us might have, as we've discussed earlier this week, had to be faced with the choice of, do I stay committed to my community or do I go to the more seductive assimilationist route? We've had all kinds of opportunities and avenues to choose which way to go in our career as a writer or behind the scenes. And so we would encourage our 
audience and friends and supporters to think about what would Chadwick do. Chadwick chose us, he chose love, and he did so with humility. He did so with the fierce determination and focus, and he did so with good character. And I think that there's no better way to close out this public gathering than to think about what would Chadwick do and, um, the, and consider our ancestors and all of those who even came before him, all of those ancestors who chose uh, to make the greatest sacrifice for this greatest good for people of African ancestry. On that note, I want to set up, that was a way to set up uh, what the, this segment of the program that is the libation sacred ceremony. I'm so happy to say that the Center for Black Literature has always chosen to include uh, libation as a part of its program. Because we are doing this virtually, we didn't have our regular drum processional, um, but we didn't lose sight of the importance of honoring those who have come before us, honoring those sacred uh, 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 traditions and the, the way that we honor each other by doing this libation. So I'd like people to just um, think about uh, the importance of upholding our traditions. There are a number of different ways by which one can honor their ancestors. And we have one way that, that we're doing now that is uh, very much connected to the Yoruba tradition. Uh, and I'm going to, in one quick moment, bring on our esteemed guest who will be leading the, the, uh, the libation ceremony. Uh, but if I may, if you'll indulge me for one moment, I'd like to, uh, I, I think this is a little bit childish what I'm about to say, but I think it's fitting. My first introduction to libation was through the movie uh, Cooley High in 1975. I was seven or six in 1975 and and saw that movie and I remember it very well. I re it resonated with me. It was an amazing thing to see us on camera, even at that very, very young age. I didn't know a lot about those adult themes, but I remember it and I just remember being in love with us, seeing us and, and our cultural traditions as African-Americans played out on the screen. Uh, so many of you, of course, know that Eric Monty was the screenwriter and how fitting would it be for us to invoke him. He's not an ancestor. Uh, he is alive and we pray for his, his well-being. Uh, but I just thought it would be fitting that, that uh, for me as a presenting partner and, and a friend of Dr. Green and a, and a service provider for the center to make this come full circle about libation, about a black screenwriter, about our cultural presentation, about the pioneering role that Cooley High was uh, so yes, it's a childish reference because I was uh, uh, under 10, but I thought it appropriate um, because we remember uh, the, uh, I don't know if it was Cochise or, or Preach that uh, poured libation and gave reference to, to those who had passed. So let's come full circle. Let's uh, contemplate the tradition that this is, the invocation, the bringing uh, the honoring of those who have come before us and the guidance and the wisdom that they provide for us, be it as intuition or, or just the ways that we learn from those. And that's the spirit of this conference, right? The learning, the coming together, the community. Um, that's just an overview in a very basic way about um, some of the things that we can consider when we think about libation. Um, but more specifically, I'd like to bring on on uh, someone who is very dear to me, who is a friend of the Center for Black Literature. And I'll do a super, super brief introduction of Chief Baba Neil Clark. He is an African Amer a master African-American percussionist. He has toured with some of the, the most notable and revered world-class musicians, some of uh, whose names you know, Baba Randy Weston, who was an ancestor. Uh, Harry Belafonte, he was a part of that ensemble for nearly 15 years, touring all over the world with Harry Belafonte, who is still with us, um, and so many other people. Uh, he has been involved in a student of Yoruba culture since he was 13. So, so beyond his professional career as a, 
uh, African, African American percussionist and an independent scholar and a recent fellow of the uh, Schomburg Center here in New York. Uh, he is also an initiate of, of Ifa. He is a Babalao. He has been a practitioner of Yoruba culture, uh, the Esheshe practice and Lukumi practice and a leader in the spiritual community um, for decades. And so th that is a great deal of qualification uh, by which he uh, leads us in the spiritual ceremony. Uh, he is also a chief, a real chief. He was installed as a chief. He is Alufo Pejo Awo of Oshogbo, Oshun State, Nigeria. So he brings a great deal of wealth and wisdom and guidance. Um, so we're going to turn this over to him. And I'd like to say that he is Baba Baba to me. He is the father of my Baba, of my teacher, of my Oluo, Chief Ayanda Clark. Um, I have a duty to say that. It is my honor to, to, to do so. So on that note, uh, on that very brief bio, I'm going to ask our beloved Chief Baba Neil Clark to uh, come on. There you are, Baba. Aboro Oboye Abosiche. Aboro Good to see you, Baba. We welcome you. I'm going to scoot out your way. I'm going to turn this over as you lead us in libation of some of the uh, writers of African ancestry who are connected to directly or indirectly connected to the Center for Black Literature. So we thank you and we welcome you, Baba. Good evening, everyone. I pray that everyone is well and their families are well and, and safe in these challenging times. Uh, my name is Chief Baba Neil Clark, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this evening, albeit, albeit virtually, to offer libation for this auspicious evening of this incredible 15th National Black Writers Conference 2020. I'd like to offer my congratulations to honorees this evening, and I'd like to thank Dr. Brenda Green and the staff of the Center for Black Literature for the invitation to attend and participate this evening and for a killer work songs. I'm sorry. Uh, in spite of the pandemic and our isolation, I've personally been informed and inspired by the conversations that I've heard listening to the various sessions in this conference over the last couple of days. And not a business at hand. For those of you who may not know me, as Ala Kay said, I'm an initiated Lukumi priest of more than 30 years. Uh, I'm initiated by Balao, and I received the chieftaincy title in Oshobo, Nigeria. It is with this sanction that I perform the libation this evening. I'll be performing the libation in the Lukumi dialect as is spoken in the diaspora in Cuba and in the diaspora. Considering that we are remote and virtual, I don't know if anyone got the memo, but um, if you have water to accompany me in your space, so that we may participate in a libation together. That would be wonderful. You could take a glass of water and you could dip it in your fingers in the water and drop it on the floor or on the soil of a plant if that's appropriate. And as I mentioned the different statements in the libation, if you could say to yourself out loud, Ashe, which means so be it, then we can continue. So I assume I have the sanction of my elders. So we begin. Tutu, Omi Tutu, Ile Tutu, Ana Tutu, Ona Tutu, Enu Tutu, Mojuba Olo de Mare, Mojuba Olo Joni, Mojuba Leda, Mojuba Lemi, Mojuba Du Mare, Mojuba Room, Mojuba Laye, Mojuba Lupressi, Mojuba Lofi. Mujuba Rina Rode, Mujuba Bobo Eda, Mujuba Igba in a Molojuko tomb, Mujuba Igba in a Molojuko sea, Mujuka Leni, Iribo in a Mole, Mojuba Oru, Mojuba Shupa, 
Mujuba aye, Mujubi ile, Mujuba omi, Mujuba inya, Mujuba fefe, Mujuba rigu merin aye, Mujubi alaru, Mujubi waru, Mujuba riwa, Mujuba gunsu, Mujuba rita, Mujuba gungu, Mujuba wo ia mi a shirongo, Mujuba luo tu, Mujuba luo si, Iba baba, Iba ye ye, Iba luo si waju, Iba jubonakan, Iba koda, Iba sheda, Iba bobo egun, he delay me. Iba bobo, bobo egun, bobo enia. I pay homage to the ancestors of everyone that is with us this evening. Now, at this point, I would like to pay homage to the ancestors of the Center for Black Literature. So as I say the names, you can say Ashe. Iba, John Oliver Killings. Iba Chinua Achebe, Iba Maya Angelou, Iba James Baldwin, Iba Tony Kare Bambada, Iba Amiri Baraka, Iba Kamal Braithwaite, Iba Gwendolyn Brooks, Iba Octavia Butler, Iba Steve Carter, Iba Lucille Clifton, Iba Kathleen Collins, Iba Jane Cortez, Iba Asi Davis, Iba Ruby D, Iba W. E. B. Du Bois. E by Henry Dumas, E by Ernest Gaines, E by William Greaves, E by Lorraine Hansberry, E by Langston Hughes, E by Zora Neale Hurston, E by June Jordan, E by Adrian Kennedy, E by John Lewis, E by Audrey Lord, E by Paul Marshall, E by Oscar Michaud, E by Tony Morrison, E by Karen, Carolyn Rogers, E by Antizaki Shange, E by John Singleton. Eba Derek Walcott, Eba John A. Williams, Eba August Wilson, Eba Lerone Bennett, Eba Amy Cesare, Eba Shake Anta Diop, Eba Catherine Dunham, Eba D.O. Fagunwa, Eba Do Dr. K. Kia Buseke Fukiao, Eba Kofi Ganaba, Eba Louis Reyes Rivera, Eba J.A. Rogers, Eba Toro Schomburg, Eba Usman Sembene, Iba Fela Shawande, Iba Bobo Egun of the National Black uh, Writers Conference. Iba, 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 To Iba Nation. On that, I would like to bid you a good evening. Have a wonderful evening. And again, congratulations to all of the honorees. Ashe, thank you. Ashe, I'm getting chills right now. Thank you so much, Chief Baba Neil Clark. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the awards and tribute ceremony for the 15th National Black Writers Conference. I'm Dr. Antoinette Roberson, Grammy-nominated singer, songwriter, educator, and activist. And it is my absolute pleasure to be your host for this evening's occasion. And what an occasion for us to come together, albeit virtually, to honor the life and the achievements of our esteemed honorees, Mr. Paul Clay, Ms. Dominique Morisot, Mr. Stanley Nelson, Mr. Volzer Rivers, and Mr. Richard Wesley. In their own unique way and through their fantastic work for the stage and in film, each of them has inspired us, moved us, and made our lives richer because of the work that they have created and produced and we appreciate the work they continue to do with creativity, passion, and truth. I am equally delighted to be a part of this well-regarded conference and tradition of celebrating Black writers and literature hosted by the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College. Black literature has significantly impacted my life. I can recall as a, a young child of eight writing my very first song I was always an imaginative child, but I was truly inspired by the works of Toni Morrison, Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, Richard Wright, and Zora Neale Hurston to dream beyond the rainbow, resulting in me writing seven number one billboard songs, directing and writing plays for historically black colleges and universities, and ultimately being nominated for a Grammy. A little girl from Houston, Texas, y'all. And that's why it is it's, it's paramount 
that we pay tribute to our writers, scholars, cultural historians, and trailblazers who have left a legacy and who are continuing to influence our worldview through the essence and energy of their intellectual property. I wanna thank all of you for joining us on this momentous occasion, <clears throat> pardon me, of 15 years. It is your support that truly makes a difference. It's your support that helps to ensure the survival of our esteemed black institutions, such as Megar Evers College, the Center for Black Literature, Howard University, Third World Press, Restora Restoration Art at Bedford Stuyvesant's Restorations Corporation, and the Schomburg Institute for Research in Cultural Black Culture. Without further ado, this woman is such a mentor and inspiration for me and for several of you out there, I'm so sure. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brenda Green, Director of the National Black Writers Conference, Founder and Executive Director at the Center for Black Literature and Professor of English at Mecker Evers College of the City University of New York. Dr. Green. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberson. And thank you, Chief Barber. Neil, thank you, April Silver, and welcome everyone. Wow, the, there are, the spirit is here. And like uh, Dr. Roberson said, I felt chills as you read each of those names, Chief Barbara and Neil. So many of them I knew, so many of them I remember seeing at our National Black Writers Conferences, which were started at Megar Evers College by the late John Oliver Killens in 1986. At least half of them have been part of our conference. So thank you for helping us to remember. Thank you, Dr. Roberson, for underscoring the importance of our institutions, our Black cultural institutions. And I want to add to that, that Megar Evers College is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And so Megar Evers College, a predominantly Black institution in the City University of, of New York is also one of those institutions that should be honored and remembered. I'd like to um, acknowledge some VIPs we have in the audience today. Uh, we have, um, or we have Dr. We have Inez Barron, our city council member. We have uh, Charles Barron, assembly council member. Welcome. We also have in the audience our Center for Black Literature board members, Marcia White, uh, Richard Jones, Richard Wesley, and I know if he's not here, but he was here, Patrick Buddington. And I understand that one of our founders, Dr. Al Van, is also in the house. I also like to acknowledge um, Sonia Sanchez, who has been here with us at the conference, and Edgewich. Dondekat. So welcome. Uh, we have we have celebrated both Edwidge Dondekat and Sonia Sanchez. I also like to acknowledge our sponsors and programs. Akila Work Songs is our presenting partner for the 15th National Black Writers Conference. The Office of New York City Council Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, the Office of New York City Council Member Inez Barron, the CUNY Office of Academic Affairs. Con Edison, the Office of Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, the Amazon Literary Partnership, and Brooklyn Reader. We have a listing of all of our sponsors, program, media, and community partners in our commemorative journal, which you can uh, upload or download, I should say, from the Center for Black Literature website. If you go to the Center for Black Literature website, and go to the National Black Writers Conference, you will be able to download our commemorative journal, which lists all of our partners. We have many partners. It lists all of our National Black Writers Conference steering committee members. And you will see all of the ads that have been placed to help us celebrate the conference. And of course, you will have a listing of the conference schedule and the bios of all of our conference honorees and conference writers and scholars. So please do that. We also are taking time at this conference to pay tribute to and to honor Toni Morrison, our noble 
laureate. She won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And you will hear more about that in a, in a shortly. We honored Chaswick Bozeman, but we have a special um, dedication to Toni Morrison by Sandra Guzman. Uh, Toni Morrison was the chair for the 10th National Black Writers Conference. And as you know, um, our beloved Toni Morrison is the author of numerous novels, over 11 novels, children's books, essays. Um, she had such a, a indelible impact on the literature and we will always remember and um, acknowledge her and pay tribute to her. So we've had a glorious opening for our conference. Uh, we opened for the culture with Talib Kweli and Jessica Kiermore on the first day. That was moderated by April Silver. We continued on Saturday with scholarly panels on the conference theme and a really wonderful presentation by our elders from the Dr. Edith Rock Elders Writers Workshop. Our writers uh, talked about home remedies and they represented remedies from different parts of the African diaspora, which included um, the Caribbean, of course, the United States and, um, and Africa. We also um, had a program uh, called A Jazz State of Mind. And I love that title because I think it represents where we are at this time. We're in a jazz state of mind. We are not stationary. We have to understand that we are fluid. And the, the panel we had provided insights on the kinds of films that uh, are being produced and the, the intricate nature of music to the production of film. On Friday morning, we opened with a town hall and an insightful discussion on the role of the media, critics, and reviewers of Black plays and films. And then we continued with a vib vibrant roundtable on the impact of hip hop and popular culture on playwriting and screenwriting. A roundtable on the value of telling our own complicated stories and two film discussions that explored activism identity and race. Today, we continued with roundtables on defying stereotypes, writing plays and films from the black gaze, uh, black theater and film, looking back and moving forward, and the playwright and screenwriter as activists. So we have had a, a glorious day and we are continuing um, with uh, this tribute. And as I thought about um, the theme of the conference, one of the writers, the late writer who continued to come to my mind was August Wilson. I could not get him out of my mind because when I sat down and began to think about putting this conference together over two years ago, I was reminded of what August Wilson said and his speech at the biennial third Theater Communications National Conference. He emphasized that race matters. And he said, race is the largest, most identifiable and most important part of our personality. It is the largest category of identification because it is the one that most influences your perception of yourself. And it is the one to which others in the world of men must respond. Race is also an important part of the American landscape as America is made up of an amalgamation of races from all parts of the globe. He also testified on the ground on which he stands on a, and on the many grounds on which he and his ancestors have toiled and the ground of theater on which his fellow artists and he have labeled to bring forth daring, lacerating, and often healing truths. The words of August Wilson epitomize the themes of this conference and the work that our honorees, our writers and scholars are doing. So as we think about the outcomes of this conference, we should remember that race is an important part of the American landscape. If we had any illusions, they should have been wiped clean by now when we look at the results of this election. Our country is more divided than ever. 
And it is clear to me and to many that race and racism are sowing the seeds of this division. We must remember our ancestors and build upon their legacy. We must remember that we are in a jazz state of mind and that jazz is poetry without words. So infuse your writing with the natural rhythms of life. We must remember that cultures do not survive without art and to create art that feeds the spirit and celebrates the life of black America by designing strategies for survival and posterity. This is the time in which we do that. And we thought about those themes as we thought about ways to honor our playwrights, screenwriters, documentarians, directors, and producers. So um, I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. And I am going to now introduce city council member Inez Barron, who is chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a strong supporter of the Center for Black Literature. Welcome, Doc. Welcome, Inez Barron. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenda Green, and to the Center for Black Literature. Uh, congratulations on this, your 15th Black National Black Writers Conference. Uh, normally, we'd be at Mega Evers in the auditorium there and celebrating and hugging each other and greeting each other, and the music would be emanating. We're in a different environment, we're virtual, but nonetheless, we're excited to be here. And my husband, Assemblymember Charles Barron, sends his greetings as well. As, as we were listening to uh, Chief um, uh, Baba Nelson, uh, Neil Clark talk about the ancestors, it reminded me of the Bible phrase that says we are encompassed round about by such a great cloud of witnesses. And as Dr. Clark, called all of those names. We thought about all of them and had some recollection, knowing that they have set examples for us of what it means to be committed to our people and working for our people and making sure that our culture is reflected and acknowledged and valued. And it's up to us to continue to go on this path and to pass it on and to be able to have the pride of knowing that our work comes from our ancestors, our ancestral ancestors, eons back. And it's up to us to reflect what's going on now and this day and pass it on and have it as an example. I'm so pleased to be able to be here. Normally I would have proclamations from the city council to present to the honorees, but that department is not operating, but at an appropriate time, we will make sure that your honorees are acknowledged and given those proclamations from the city council. I just want to thank you once again for inviting me to participate and encourage you to move on with your plans for other events and that this gala event pay tribute to these honorees who are so well deserving of the tribute that you're giving to them. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you. Thank you, thank you so much for your presence and for your ongoing support. And we love you. You and too. your husband. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. I am so here, Dr. Green. And let me just tell you, Dr. Green, you continue to just inspire me. You're such a visionary leader, fearless leader, you know, and you truly continue to feed my spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. And so our next presenter, everyone, is Ms. Sandra Guzman. Sandra is an Emmy award-winning journalist, author, and documentarian whose work explores American identity at the intersection of culture, race, gender, sexuality, and spirituality. She creates art that fosters empowerment through the telling of stories of people and communities outside the margins by reframing exclusionary narratives and celebrating marginalized voices. Sandra was the last journalist to interview Nobel laureate Toni Morrison for the artful film Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. She's the author of the New Latinas Bible, 
Her film work has appeared on PBS, Netflix, Hulu, and HBO, and her stories have aired on NBC News and CNN, among others. Without further ado, Ms. Sandra Guzman. Hi, everybody. Please receive my virtual hugs. I am coming to you from New Hampshire, and uh, this is uh, Abenaki country, so I just want to uh, acknowledge the land uh, that I am uh, sleeping and living in for the past few years. Congratulations, Dr. Green. I agree with Antoinette. You continue to inspire me so much with your work, with your commitment, with uh, your choosing us. And um, so many more blessings also to the Barons. I was so excited to see them on the screen. And, um, and congratulations to the honorees and, um, and to uh, the celebration of the 15th anniversary of um, Black culture and Black writing. I, um, I'm just so honored that Dr. Green asked me to share some moments with you about our dearly departed and most wonderful ancestor, uh, Ms. Toni Morrison. And, um, I miss Tony. I, I, I miss her smile. I miss her laugh. I miss her wit. I miss her side eyes. I miss her beautiful face. Her voice was so lovely and it was so fierce and it was so necessary. Tony, like Chadwick, chose us. Tony was, and I know that I'm not alone in feeling this. She was medicine for me. She was spirit medicine for me. It's been a year and some months since she left to the ancestral plane and the world, I believe, has been impoverished by her absence. Ours was a spiritual friendship and it served my highest good. I, I first met Tony in this wonderful place where writers and readers meet. It's a very magical place. And I read all of her novels back to back um, in 2013, beginning in 2013 for a two year period. After I moved to New Hampshire from New York City, I was very lonely. I was the only brown girl, the only Puerto Rican in uh, the entire state I felt. And I needed some company. And so I did this big read of, of her work. And after the, after the read, I, I thought that um, I was doing this uh, reading for fun and for company. And when you read Tony, you realize you're reading her for liberation. I thought I was reading her to find the relatives that my husband said reminded him of characters in her novels. And I was reading Tony for freedom and for reconnecting to my ancestors. And after I finished this big read, I wanted to see a film about this beautiful artist who delivered us and delivered the world um, from uh, this trapped language um, and delivered the beauty um, of the stories that she shared. And I Googled Toni Morrison, American Masters, and there was no film about her. And so The Pieces I Am was a film that I wanted to see. I interviewed Toni for two days in this magical boathouse where a ghost named Beloved came to visit. And I remember when I left the set and we packed up and I was driving home, I thought this film could just be Tony on Tony. She was generous and loving and witty and brilliant. And Tony really, she really appreciated me because I understood her work and I didn't ask her any stupid questions. <laughs> So a few months after I interviewed her, she asked me to go visit her. And, um, and the first time I went to visit her, she, um, it was a snowy Sunday and I bought her carrot cupcakes from Billy's in Chelsea. I bought her 
uh, white roses. Um, I went to Whole Foods and I got her a bunch of white roses because I knew that she loved gifts with meaning. And I bought her a bottle of champagne. We were just going to celebrate. And I took a yellow cab and I got to the, um, the Hudson, uh, the, the home on the Hudson River in uh, Piermont, New York. And when she took a good look at me and she said, you look like a wild Australian Aborigine. And we laughed and we always laughed. Um, we always laughed. Tony was a lot of fun. She always shared gems, but Tony was also interested in and very curious about people. And so she would always ask me to share stories about the root women in my family and my Caribbean family. And um, the ones who, who work the earth, the ones who harvested the sea, uh, the ones who smoke cigars, the women who smoke cigars, and the women who bathe naked in rivers, and the women who sold moonshine to feed their babies. She wanted to know about my Black and Indigenous aunties, my grandmothers, my grandfathers. And she taught me um, to reconnect with them in a way that I hadn't reconnected them um, because of colonization. And so I'll always be grateful for Tony to bring me back home. Um, I realized that a few, um, after a few visits, that who I was going to see was not necessarily Toni Morrison. It was um, a girl named Chloe Ardelia Wofford. One time um, I went and she was telling me the story about how Princeton was going to rename a building after her. And she was kind of excited um, and impressed that they would do this, um, but something was bothering her. And she, she told me that she had asked them if they would, instead of naming the building Toni Morrison, they would name it Chloe Ardelia, Ardelia Wofford and not, and not this famous Toni Morrison persona. Um, and they declined. And so I came to visit her on the heels of this, of this um, news. And they told her that um, the, world, the world didn't really know Chloe Ardelia Wofford. The, the world knew Toni Morrison. And when she told me that, she gave me the biggest side eyes because I think what she was trying to say behind all of this was always a girl named Chloe from Lorraine, Ohio. I have been thinking a lot about Toni these days thinking about the words that she would offer in response to the pandemics that we are trying to survive. A pandemic that has killed so many of our brothers and sisters around the world and here in this nation and has plunged in this nation 18% um, of our community into black families, into poverty. And what she would say about the racism that has been stoked in the past four years. I know what she said every time um, that orange monster would come on her television. She would say, oh, he needs to shut up. He's infecting my television. But what would she say about all the malevolence that's raging around the planet, the wickedness that is um, despairing some of us? And in 2000, Four, she wrote this, this essay for the nation and it's been quoted um, a lot these days. And this is where she says, this is precisely the time when artists go to work and there is no time for despair. There's no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. I, I've gone back to reading her again and again because I find solace in her books and her words. She's really my Bible. Um, she, reminds, she reminds us uh, so much, right? So much of what's important. Um, she reminds me most of all to commit to caring for one another, to be and to build in community. In an essay that I recently read um, that's in, included in her last collection, The Price of Wealth, The Cost of Care, she's exploring the theme of money 
and she calls money the not so secret mistress in all of our lives. And it's worth reading in its entirety. And in this essay, she does it again. She reminds us of the real job that we have. She says, if we are free, we need to free somebody else. If you have some power, your job is to empower somebody else. She reminds us again as writers, as artists, to bear witness beyond price and beyond cost. Art she writes, invites us to take the journey beyond price, beyond costs, into bearing witness to the world as it is and as it should be. Art invites us to know beauty and to solicit it from even the most tragic of circumstances. Art, she says, reminds us that we belong here. And if we serve, we last. Thank you so much for allowing me to share a few of the precious moments I shared with the great master um, of words. And I bless you and each and every one of you. And I wish you a safe uh, and journey um, in these next couple of months, which I know are going to be tough. And um, to remember Tony and um, to remember that um, she would want us showing up for each and every one of us in everything that we do in everything that we do. Thank you. Sandra, I just met you, but I feel like you are my sister friend and I am so stealing spiritual medicine. I'm so stealing that. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, sister, for enlightening us and for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to everyone our first honoree, Mr. Carl Clay. Carl Clay studied TV and theater at Maine International TV Film Institute and at the Third World Cinema Training Institute. Clay went on to get his feet wet on his first film, Grease Lightning. As the founder and CEO of Black Spectrum Theater, Clay has produced more than 450 plays and written and directed 20 films aimed at African-American youths. Clay has produced more than 40 jazz concerts, and he has written more than 20 plays. He has been awarded five Adelco Awards as producer of the year for the productions Two Trains Running, Kingfish, and Deadwood Dick, Legend of the West. Without further ado, Mr. Carl Clay. Good evening, good evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, and uh, thank you to the uh, Center for Black Literature. Uh, I'm so thankful for this sacred honor tonight. Uh, it's a privilege to have been able to create and operate a theater where our people could come and work and create and present their work and produce it in a place where others could show the best of what they had, their energy, and inspiration to be put on stage. I'm blessed to be able to have been a, a part of an institution that has been a custodian for some of our cultural treasures. It's been simply awe inspiring. And to have literally transversed five decades with over 400 plays and 25 films, using our art for social justice and to have done it through the trenches of uncertainty of funding, racial politics in New York, which we all know is happening on a daily basis. Clearly, this was not because of money or material ailments that we've made it. Although that is important, it was clearly because of the work of our creator and the God force that lives within our positive intentions and the incredible contributions of some of the following playwrights and directors. And so I'd like to share this award this evening with people like Celeste Walker, Pearl Cleach, Lisa Thompson, Ossie Davis and Ruby D, Rob Black, Jacqueline Wade, Fulton Hodges, Joseph Walker, Ron Milner, Warren Burdine, Levy Lee Simon, Charles Phil Fuller, Richard Wesley, Harlan Penn, Beverly Burchette, 
Lofton Mitchell, August Wilson, James Baldwin, Lawrence Holder, Dan Owens, Ella Joyce, PJ Gibson, Mustafa Mutora, August Wilson, Lee Hunkins, Ron Weich, Ed Shockley, Douglas Turner Ward, The New Black Fest, Ken Atkins, and Ms. Morceau, and of course the 10 writers who work were presented as part of the Hands Up and Untamed series that was presented at our theater, Langston Hughes, PJ Gibson, and Melvin Van Peoples. I'd also like to thank Bed Howard, Fulton Hodges. Uh, these were directors who've worked at our theater, some of them, and they all do uh, are due their respect because they brought so much to making our institution what it is. Arthur French, Reggie Life, Rome Neal, Chanel Perry, Amani Douglas, Lori Hayes, Lorna Littleway, Tanya Pinkins, Gerald Van Heerden, Harlan Penn, Beverly Burchette, Woody King, Imani Douglas, Lisa McRae, Dean Irby, Whitfield Sims, and B.J. Pierce Astwood. And I'd like to thank some of my mentors, Cliff Frazier, Buddy Butler, Woody King, Marjorie Moon, Melvin Van Peoples, Oscar Brown Jr., and Roy Ayers. Um, back in the early 70s, uh, I'll say in the late 70s, there was a play that we did called Deadwood Dick, and there was a write-up in the Amsterdam News. And uh, the writer uh, talked about the play, it was a hit, and people came out to see this production. But what happened was, is in the description of the play, they referred to the producer of the play uh, as you know, the kind of spark plug to make all of these things happen. However, they spelled producer as poor producer. And that kind of caught on and people started um, calling me saying, Clay, they've made fun of you, of you guys over there, Black Spectrum, because they called it the poor producer. And I thought about it and I said, yeah, well, we don't have much money. So poor producer is truly fitting. And so when I wrote my first book, I thought that it was important to talk about what is a producer. And um, it doesn't mean that the work is any less. We always reach for excellence. But it does mean uh, to dream and imagine with near delusionary belief, to lead and function with the inadequate resources, to adapt, to overcome impossible obstacles, to bring to market and or create plays, films, concerts, poetry, while stretching pennies and materials to their absolute outer limits to effectively bring into, into being something with nothing day in and day out, to do with less knowing your artistic counterparts have the luxury of doing with triple the resources that you have to squeeze water from a rock. Um, that's what it's taken to do this for 50 years. And so um, uh, it, is, it, it is clearly a blessing. It is an honor. And um, we continue to be proud of our past and excited about the future. I, I thank God for um, all of those people who made the theater what it is, the board, the staff, all of the actors and performers who've come and uh, shared their work and their creativity with us. We continue to do it, not just for us, but for our people, because we believe that our work is important in bringing forward a new tomorrow for all of our people. And so we do it with love, we do it with sincerity, and we do it for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Carl Clay. Thank you so much for your vision Thank you for the work you do. We are pleased to present you with the Douglas Turner Award. The Douglas Turner Award is presented to Carl Clay in recognition of his work in the found, as founder and CEO of the Black Spectrum Theater, the 15th National Black Writers Conference Center for Black Literature, Megger Evers College. Thank you so much, Douglas Ward. I'm Thank Douglas you. Ward. Thank you so much, Paul Clay. 
we appreciate you and continue to do the work. You have given us a lot of inspiration and may you have another 50 years. Okay. Thank <laughs> this you. will be mailed to you. All right. Thank I don't you. know if you can see it. Yes, I can. It's okay. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It is gorgeous. I want one too, Dr. Green. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations once more, Mr. Clay, for all that you've done Thank you. to bring enlightenment to our lives. Thank you. And so our next recipient is award-winning playwright, Ms. Dominique Marceau. She is the author of The Detroit Project, a, a three-play cycle, which includes the following plays, Skeleton Crew, Paradise Blue, and Detroit 67. She is also the Tony nominated book writer on the new Broadway musical, Ain't Too Proud to Beg, The Life and Times of the Temptations. Marcel is alumna of the Public Theater Emerging Writers Group, Women's Project Lab and Lark Playwrights Workshop and has developed work at Sundance Lab, Williamstown Theater Festival and Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Conference. She most recently served as co-producer on the Showtime series, Shameless. And I tell you, that is one of my favorites. Without further ado, Ms. Dominique Marceau. Okay. Hello, and Dominique Marceau, before you speak, yes. we'd like to present you with the Adrian Kennedy Award. The <laughs> Adrian Kennedy Award is presented to Dominique Marceau in recognition of her work as an award-winning script playwright, the 15th National Black Writers Conference, Center for Black Literature, Megar Evers College. And I'm going to show again the award to Dominique Morisot. We are so proud of you. Thank you. It's been a long journey. Yes, ma'am. And um, really appreciate and congratulate you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, and everyone, I mean, what, what an amazing uh, day this is in cyberspace. Um, I wanna share that when, when I first moved to New York, I attended a gathering in Harlem that was filled with black writers, poets, booksellers, everything. I had on my sarong that I always wore to summer events when I was feeling particularly black and beautiful to of course blend with all the other black and beautifuls. There were a lot in Harlem at that time. I remember what I was wearing because it was a transformative day for me. I didn't know until later that it was the Harlem Book Fair and it was at that fair that I first heard of the National Black Writers Conference. I was a young poet who had just moved to New York from Detroit to pursue a career in acting, playwriting, and poetry. I wanted to tell stories, wax poetic in prose, and live in the world of language and literature. I thought it would be much easier than it was. I thought I would be welcomed by the larger theater community for my words and imagination. I was not. It took me 10 years, 10 plus years, for me to even make the radar of the off-Broadway sector of my industry. Three years after that, for my first play, Detroit 67, to be produced in New York. And six years after that, to have my first musical, Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations, premiere on Broadway. That was after about uh, 18 years total in New York City. While I hold my accomplishments dear, there is something different when the work leaves the sacred grounds on which it was built and is measured and critiqued and mishandled by those outside of the culture. But the one place where my voice was always welcome without censorship, gaze, or limitation was in the community of Black writers and readers and story lovers. The one place that embraced me from the onset was the Black literary community. I was in Harlem poetry anthologies. I was part of the Detroit, Harlem, Brooklyn poetry villages. I was in Black writers workshops. I was appreciated for my voice that was birthed inside of the Black literary canon. I was raised on Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni and Intazaki Shange and Pearl Clegg. I was lifted by Langston Hughes and County Cullen and Dudley Randall and the last poets. I was writing in their tradition the complex multi-layered depths of our existence, the truth of who we are 
under our own gaze. This is what the legend of writers gave me permission to do for myself. And I took it and I keep on taking it. So to finally be recognized and honored by the very same National Black Writers Conference that I first heard about after attending that festival in Harlem is a beautiful confirmation that I was always right where I needed to be. I dreamed of attending the next one, of someday being asked to attend a future one, of being among the storytellers whose words have spoken life over me and given me a sense of purpose and belonging on the shoulders of the literary giants that came before me in the community of people whose culture and history was a part of my lived shared experience. And I have now worked for the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College in the Re-Envisioning Our Lives Through Literature program. I have been fully integrated into this community that always felt like it was my home even before I knew what it was. I am lifted by this award, by this village, and by the legend that we all come from. Thank you so much for honoring me, and I hope that I can continue to be a griot for us and to help make space for more and more of us in generations to come, to encourage Black writers to be free and uninhibited. I want nothing more than for our total liberation inside the art and outside of it, that our voices are never muted, that our stories and our bodies are no longer policed, that our black joy and our black pain has a place to address itself, be held, be lifted and be healed, that we are fully able to be our complex selves. I will write and fight for us to keep taking up spaces in sarongs, in Harlem or Brooklyn or Detroit or DC or the Shy or Atlanta or wherever we dwell, locally or globally, internationally, it's our world. And may we keep writing ourselves into existence. To Dr. Green, to my fellow honorees for laying the groundwork for me to the staff and tireless committee of the Center for Black Literature and the National Black Writers Conference. It takes a village to raise a conference. This I know from experience. So with great love and solidarity, I humbly thank you. You are certainly a griot for me, my babies, the babies that are on this call. You are, you know what, sister? I just champion you and you keep breaking those barriers down because I know how hard that is to break that ceiling. And when I saw your name on Shameless, I said, go, do it, keep moving. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next award recipient is considered one of the foremost thought leaders of the black experience. Mr. Stanley Nelson is today's leading documentarian of the African-American experience. His films combine compelling narratives with rich historical details that illuminate the underexplored American past. Nelson, a MacArthur Genius Fellow, also received the National Humanities Medal from President Obama in 2013. And in 2016, he was awarded the Achievement Award from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Nelson's latest film, Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool, the definitive look at the life and career of the iconic Miles Davis premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2019. In 2018, Nelson directed The Story of Access, a short film that examined the history and impact of racial profiling in public spaces. Other notable films by Nelson include Jonestown, The Life and Death of People's Temple, and the Emmy-nominated The Black Press Soldiers Without Swords. Dr. Green. Thank you. And uh, we want to see Stanley Nelson. Thank you, Stanley Nelson. We are so pleased to present this award to you. The Center for Black Literature is presenting Stanley Nelson with the, there you are, 
The Oscar Michelle Award is presented to Stanley Nelson Jr. in recognition of his outstanding work as a documentarian of the Black experience. The 15th National Black Writers Conference, Center for Black Literature at Megar Everest College. And um, Stanley, this is the award. Beautiful. Congratulations. And I'm going to, we're going to hear some remarks from you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, National Black Writers Conference and Dr. Green. I'm just, uh, you know, so honored to receive this award. So honored to be in the incredible company that, that I'm in. I can't believe it. So I, I, I'm just totally honored. Um, and, and also I want to thank it, thank you in, in the name of all, of all my collaborators at Firelight Films and Firelight Media and all the collaborators on all the different projects. You know, they, they kind of go un, unsung sometimes, but, but you know, we couldn't do that without them. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we're living through really hard times right now and, and just kind of weird and crazy times. Um, you know, we're, li we're living through the time of COVID. We're living through the time uh, of, of, of protests in the street over the murder of George Floyd and, and, and others. We're living um, with the crazy man who will go unnamed in the White House. Um, but, but I think that, um, you know, now more than ever, you know, we were are reminded that we need to pull together, that, that we really need to pull together. Um, I miss the human contact, you know, I, I never, I never thought I would miss it so much. You know, uh, I can't wait to to just give everybody a hug. You know, and 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 just you know be be among people. Um, but uh, you know, there, there's unity in strength. There's strength in unity. I'm sorry. There's strength in unity, and and you know, um, um, we will come out of this, and we will come out of it stronger. I know I will because you know I I. I will really um, cherish the moments that I spend with, with humans. Um, I, I hopefully, hopefully I won't take for granted any, any more or, or, you know, much more um, uh, the human connection uh, of people and the human connection of, of creativity. So, um, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm just really honored to, to, to receive this award. Um, you know, it, it helps me to, to push on, especially, you know, in these times. Um, and I, again, you know, um, hopefully we'll, we'll be out of this soon and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting in the auditorium together, you know, next year. So thank you again. Thank you so much again. And uh, again, I'm, I'm just so honored um, to be among this company. Thank you so much, Mr. Nelson. Thank I appreciate you. So <laughs> we absolutely do. Our next recipient is Mr. Voza Rivers. Mr. Rivers is known for his theater productions and trend-setting documentaries. Um, he is a leading director from Harlem, founding member and executive producer of the New Heritage Theater Group, established in 1964. He is the executive producer and co-founder of Impact Repertory Theater, the Oscar-nominated Youth Division of New Heritage Theater Group, led by U.S. Director, Activist, and Educator, Jamal Joseph. Mr. Vosa Rivers is a founding member and chairman of the Harlem Arts Alliance, a not-for-profit arts service organization established in 2001 with 350 members, including museums, libraries, colleges, churches, visuals, performing arts, directors, filmmakers, the full gamut. He's touched them all. As an event special projects producer, Rivers has worked with Nina Simone, Ray Charles, Celia Cruz, Nancy Wilson, Tito Puente, Miriam McKeeva, OB winners Daniel Beatty, and Roger Guinevere. Without further ado, Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Roberson. And we'd like to see Voza Rivers. Voza Rivers. Okay. When I heard your story last night, I, I just, I knew you were doing a lot, but you are phenomenal. And we are, we are very, very pleased to present Voza Rivers 
with the Ozzie Davis Award. It's presented to Vosa Rivers in recognition of his work as a theater producer and documentary filmmaker, the 15th National Black Writers Conference, Center for Black Literature. Congratulations, Vosa Rivers. And here we have a picture of the award, which will be mailed to you. Congratulations to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, to uh, the, the uh, esteemed Inez and Charles Barron, thank you for your activism and support of Harlem-based and citywide uh, uh, theaters of color. You guys have been uh, our supporters from day one, articulating the importance of the work that a lot of the theaters do. This award for me is extremely important because it's directed uh, uh, and connected to my start in theater 56 years ago when Roger Furman created his own company called New Heritage Theater Group in 1964. Roger Furman was a member of the American Negro Theater with Ruby D, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, Gertrude Jeanette, and others founded by Abram Hill and also Fred O'Neill. Ozzie Davis was a, mem was a member of another theater company, uh, and, uh, uh, but he married, of course, Ruby D, and everyone assumed that he was also a member of the American Negro Theater. Ozzie Davis's relationship to Ruby when Roger Furman created his theater was one of support. So as a, uh, a young 20 year old uh, uh, person involved in the creation of a new theater, I had the pleasure of having Ozzie Davis and his wife and others, uh, Harry Belafonte uh, and others come to the support of Roger to create his new theater based on the American Negro Theater's model. So over the years, by being in theater and producing and directing, I got a chance to uh, hear and get guidance from Ozzy Davis. It was something that I... in his home. Okay, he has frozen for a moment. I'm sure we'll come back. Yes, I believe we're having technical difficulties, Dr. Green. Okay. So let's proceed. Let's proceed. All right, and our final recipient, until Mr. Rivers is able to rejoin us, everyone, uh, our final award recipient of the evening, Mr. Richard Wesley. Okay. Mr. Richard Wesley was born in Newark, New Jersey, and educated at Howard University. His work has been produced on stage and for screen and television. He has received the Drama Desk Award, NAACP Image Award, the Adelco Award, and the Castillo Award for his work in political theater. In 1971, Wesley's first play, The Black Terror, was presented at the New York Shakespearean Festival's public theater. The Mighty Gents, another play by Wesley, premiered on Broadway in 1978. In the mid-70s, Wesley began writing screenplays. Wesley produced screenplays for Uptown Saturday Night in 1974. Let's do it again in 1975. <laughs> and fast forward and Native Son in 1986. He is the author of the recently published book, It's Always Loud in the Balcony, A Life in Black Theater <laughs> from Harlem, yeah. from Harlem to Hollywood and back. Please, without, oh, Mr. Rivers has rejoined us. I think, I think he's getting back to the line, Dr. Green. Mr. Rivers? Yes. Can you hear us? Okay, let's go ahead and resume with Mr. Rivers and then we will return to Mr. Wesley. 
Mr. Oh, okay, so we, we had the pleasure of creating a play on the life of Einstein Hughes called Hughes Dreams Harlem. And we reached out to Ozzy Davis to be the narrator of that film. In the film, we had Ruby D, Amiri, and Amina Baraka, Sonia Sanchez, Kevin Power, Jessica Carey Moore, Talib Kweli, Ron Milner, Woody King, and a host of others. Ozzy Davis's uh, contribution to moving the Langston Hughes story was so powerful that uh, I would uh, I would like for a lot of the viewers and people who are involved with uh, this conference to look and go to the YouTube and look up Hughes Dreams Harlem. It is the last documentary that Ozzie Davis did before his death. And I would uh, uh, encourage you uh, to, to, to uh, uh, look at that because it connects directly uh, to why I am so honored to receive the Ozzie Davis Award. Mr. Rivers, I tell you, we are in the 21st century where technology, it's our friend and our frenemy at the same time. I'm telling you, right. thank you so much for reconnecting and continue. It's like you just, you just you're, you're a pro. We can tell you're a pro because you just started right back in where you left off. <laughs> what a fabulous life. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you so much. And, God. and I would encourage you to put that in the chat, the, the name of the, the film that you'd like us to watch. If someone can put that in the chat for us so that we can all see that. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Thank you again, Mr. Boza Rivers for all you've done. And without further ado, Mr. Richard Wesley. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Richard Wesley. So if you will hold a moment, it's wonderful to see you. Um, the Center for Black Literature, and I'm going to wait till we get your Credentials, your image back. <laughs> okay. Okay, there you are. And the Center for Black Literature is pleased to present the August Wilson Award to Richard Wesley in recognition of his outstanding work as an American playwright and screenwriter. The 15th National Black Writers Conference Center for Black Literature. Congratulations. And here is a picture of your award. Um, I think when probably when, when you begin to talk, there you are. Uh, yeah. There's a picture of your award. It will be sent to you. And thank you so much for all the work you do and all the work you've, you've done and, and your support for the Center for Black Literature as an advisory board member. Thank you. Well, Congratulations. Uh, thank you so much. And, and of course, uh, supporting uh, uh, CBL is uh, nothing short of being a labor of love. And I'm so happy to do it and so happy to be a part of um, everything that um, the center has been doing uh, for these last 15 years. And so uh, thank you, Dr. Green and uh, the Center for uh, Black Literature and the National Black Writers Conference for this tremendous honor that I received with great and most humble appreciation. I am so proud to share this moment with so many uh, esteemed colleagues uh, uh, on this uh, panel this evening. Um, this is a very inspiring moment for me, I, I, I have to say. Um, I stand on so many uh, shoulders and owe so much uh, to so many whose guidance and correction, love and devotion have been signposts leading me along this path of life. Um, uh, Owen Dotson and Ted Shine, who were my instructors at Howard. Um, Ossie Davis and Ruby D, who often visited the campus and Ossie was the one who pointed me in the uh, first direction that I needed to go uh, when I came to New York after graduation. Uh, Ed Bullens 
and Robert Macbeth at the New Lafayette Theater, where I was a member uh, for six years and uh, where I was the uh, managing editor of the uh, Black Theater Magazine and also uh, uh, grew as a writer, as a member of the uh, Black Theater Workshop there. John Oliver Killens, uh, who not only visited with us at the New Lafayette, uh, but brought me out to his home in uh, Brooklyn and um, sat me down and talked to me and talked to me and talked to me and pointed some directions that I needed to go in. Um, Indira Edwaru at the uh, Billy Holiday Theater and Joseph Papp at the Public and Lynn Meadow at the Manhattan Theater Club and James Lipton, the uh, producer uh, and Amiri Baraka, um, my homeboy who did, uh, I cannot, say enough. Uh, he was the one who uh, released lightning from a bottle while I was still a sophomore at Howard, which, uh, which is where I first saw a production of The Dutchman. And like so many other writers in my generation, pointed a way for us to go, lit the path, and uh, we've been following in his footsteps ever since. Uh, Clarence Ali at the Theater for Universal Images in Newark. Sidney Poitier, uh, who even to this day still uh, finds ways uh, uh, to say the right thing uh, and still inspires. And uh, directors like Oz Scott and Hal Scott, uh, who uh, Oz who's been with me, he's probably my best friend in the entertainment industry and uh, a very close, very close family friend for all of us Wesleys and um, Hal Scott, who's with the ancestors now, but who worked uh, so diligently uh, to give me my voice uh, as a writer, uh, as a playwright. And uh, first, last, and always, the eternal Woody King Jr., <laughs> producer extraordinaire who's, um, I've known Woody uh, for close to 50 years and uh, his advice, his friendship, um, that incredible Woody King laugh um, and uh, his insights have always proven um, uh, to lift me up at just the right time. Uh, and to all those wonderful actors uh, whose work on stage and screen over these last uh, close to 50 years uh, have brought my words to life and uh, uh, breathed life um, into uh, the plays and screenplays and even opera librettos um, that uh, I've written over that time. And finally to my wonderful wife, Valerie Wilson Wesley, a strong writer on her own with her own voice but she's always found the time to say the right thing, encourage me, inspire me, and be my best friend. I, you know, I, you know, I, uh, I can't say enough about Val. Um, but so many, all these people, they are the shoulders that I've leaned on, the shoulders that I stand on. And um, without them, without their presence in my life, I could not have been here tonight. And I thank them all. And uh, thank you all for um, just this, this uh, wonderful, wonderful honor. I'm most appreciative. And we most appreciate you, Mr. Wesley. We so appreciate you. Thank you so much for all you have contributed to our lives. And I'm so- welcome. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. And so everyone, we've come to that time in the program. We wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening. And most certainly we applaud 
our distinguished honorees. You are all beacons of light, illuminating for the world to see. I gotta do a little bit of housekeeping. And so I was told to ask that you please complete your evaluation forms that were given to you when you registered for this wonderful event. Please support our honorees. And it's on the screen there. So please support our honorees as well as the many outstanding black authors, poets, and playwrights, script writers, screenwriters in every way you can. Support black literature. Visit the Sisters Uptown Bookstore and Just Us Books by going to the center's website at www.centerforblackliterature.org. I'll say that again, www.centerforblackliterature.org. Also support vendors in the village marketplace. And now we will have closing remarks from our visionary beacon. <laughs> That's Dr. right. Dr. Brenda Green. Thank you, thank you so much. And again, congratulations, let's put our hands up to all of our honorees. Thank you, Dr. Roberson. Thank you, Chief Barbara Neal. Thank you, April Silver. Thank you, Sandra Guzman. And a special thank you to our honorees for the work they do and to all of the writers and scholars who participated in this conference an historic moment in the National Black Writers Conference era and a historic moment at Mega Rivers College, an historic moment in our country. Um, I just want to remind you that you can view the National Black Writers Conference, conference uh, programs on YouTube beginning on Monday. We'll have selected uh, programs so you'll be able to replay and reflect and rethink. Um, we also have some programs coming up. Our next major program will be the Wild Seeds Writers Retreat, which will be held February the 18th through the 12th at Mega Rivers College. It will be held, of course, virtually. And um, it's Wild Seeds named in honor of, some of you probably know, Octavia Butler. And it's an extension of the North Country Institute and Retreat for Writers of Color. We hold the, the Writers Retreat um, in the summer, usually in July, and then we have a winter retreat here in New York City. So please stay tuned for that. I also want you to stay tuned for our next conference. As you know, the National Black Writers Annual Conference, conference is held every four years in the even years and we hold it over four days. This is the 15th National Black Writers Conference. Our 16th National Black Writers Conference will be held in 2022. Please complete your evaluations. Your evaluations help to inform what we do and the themes we select for our next conference. But we have selected the honoree for our National Black Writers Symposium, which will be held next spring. Saturday, March 27th. Please put that on your calendar. We will be honoring and paying tribute to Paul Marshall. Mm. The symposium is called The Power of Voice and Place and Creating Cultural Memories. And Paul Marshall, we also lost um, last year. And we want to make sure that, that not only do we pay tribute to her, but that the general public and our students and, and um, our family knows about her and her work. Um, again, remember that you can support our writers, our artists, and our cultural institutions by um, visiting their websites and hitting that donate button. You can support them by buying their books. Sisters Uptown Bookstore is in the house on event Titan and also on the Center for Black Literature website. Please visit the Event Titan website. You'll be able to see all of our vendors. The site will be available to you until 12 o'clock, until midnight tonight. So um, we hope that you will go and visit. We have um, also Just Us Books has a place on the website. Mm -hmm. And finally, I want you to stay safe 
be well, and think about how you can be a force in charting the way forward. Thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We value you. Goodbye.